Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the White House. Uh, we're here for a very special uh, live chat with Dr. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. A very exciting day uh, to have you here. So welcome to the White House. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, Dr. Ride's joining us today because the president actually just hosted an event here at the White House about the, his STEM initiative uh, and announced Change the Equation, a new organization. Um, and the other really exciting thing we have uh, are eight students uh, from the Denver School of Science and Technology in Denver, Colorado, who are joining us. I want you guys to say hi. Hi! <laughs> so we're going to take a few of their questions uh, here in just a second, but uh, Dr. Wright, if you could start us off by talking a little bit about the event that happened today and maybe try to relate it to why uh, it should matter for these eight uh, high schoolers who are joining us today. Sure. Um, Change the Equation is uh, the initiative that it was announced today, and it's an initiative put together by companies around the country, um, large companies and small companies, who really believe that science and math education are critical to their futures because they need to hire a skilled workforce um, when you, uh, you all graduate, um, but it's also critical to the competitiveness of the country. It's, it's vital to our economy that we have uh, a workforce that understands science, understands math, understands technology, and can put those skills to practice. And you might think that this is important just for the next generation of rocket scientists or uh, environmental engineers, but it's turn it turns out that it's much more than that. It's really important for all of you uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that 80% of the jobs in the next uh, 10 years or so are going to require some background in science, math, and technology. And that's even basic living wage jobs. So it's important to everybody, and it's really important to your, uh, to your future. And it's also important because uh, you're going to need to be science literate when you, um, you, know, when you get out of, uh, out of high school, out of college, and start dealing with the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Because you know, turn on the TV. Um, log online, the issues that you see in the news have a lot of their basis in science and technology. And just to be able to understand those issues and understand how they can affect you, um, how they can affect your lives, um, to be able to vote responsibly, uh, to be able to make intelligent decisions about yourself, your community, your family, you need to have some way to understand those issues. You need to have a little bit of background in science and math. And you're at the, the stage of your education where you're getting that background right now. And that background will prepare you for um, you know, your life after high school, but it'll also uh, give you a, a really good uh, insight into uh, all the opportunities that are out there for you when you do graduate and make you prepared to take advantage of those opportunities when they come your way. Great. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, dive right into the questions, uh, Denver. Why don't you uh, raise your hand if you have one, and we'll just go uh, right around the horn here. So, first question. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Brian, and I'm uh, currently an 11th grader. And I was just wondering, what do you think was the best class you took in high school to best prepare you to go up into space? <laughs> um, well, thanks, Brian. Uh, the best class that I took in high school that prepared me to go into space, you know, it was... Um, um, interestingly enough, it was probably my calculus class. Um, I had uh, a very good teacher, a very good calculus teacher in high school. I took lots of science classes. I took lots of math classes. Um, they were all good classes, and I learned a lot. But calculus really gave me the basis and the background for uh, uh, many of the courses that I went on to when I went into, into college. And I used it um, uh, frequently while I was in the space program. So uh, just, uh, you know, I think that that was the one that, that probably um, meant the most to me going forward. I think I just heard math teachers across the country <laughs> jump, jump little shout. Che little cheer that, right? from the math teachers. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, OK, next question. Why don't you raise your hand over there? Who we got? Oh, how about you? Now remember to speak up. Okay. I'm Brianna, and I'm in the 11th grade. Um, my question is, what was it like being the first woman in space and the field in general as a woman? Um, you know, it was really, it was an, uh, an unbelievable honor both to be selected to go into space at all, 
because that's what I dreamed of doing um, you know, since the time I was younger than all of you. Um, but even more so to be the first American woman to get a chance to, to go into space. And I, you know, I worked really hard for it. I studied hard through, uh, through high school, through college, uh, through graduate school. Uh, worked even harder once I got to NASA uh, because they make sure that we're very well prepared and very well trained. They don't want to send anybody into space and trust their space shuttle or their space station to somebody who's not really well trained. So I worked really hard while I was there. And that um, my first flight was just a culmination of all that, all that hard work and, um, and all those years of, of dreaming for that, that opportunity. So it was really very, very special on a lot of different levels, both personally, um, professionally, and then also because I had a chance to represent American women um, and, and be the first one um, to get to go into space. And, and just by the way, since then, there have been many, many, many other American women. Um, we're well up over 35 different American women who've gone into space now, and that number is, um, is growing. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really rewarding. So let me actually ask a follow-up question we got through uh, the internet that gets straight to that point about uh, women in science um, that came from Morgan in Bethany Lutheran, Ohio who asks, what made you so interested in science, technology, engineering, and math? What would you tell an 11-year-old girl about the importance of these subjects and how, what she can do to pursue these? <laughs> um, you know, I, I remember that, um, that I was a lot like many, many, many um, boys and girls around the country. When I was in elementary school, I loved science. Science was my favorite, my favorite subject in, in school. And, um, uh, there was not one thing, one particular thing that triggered it. There was not one particular um, area of science that I was interested in. I just, I liked asking questions. I was curious about the world. I was curious about whether there might be life on Mars. I was curious about all those points of light up in the sky. Um, you know, I was cur curious about what was growing in the, the riverbed near our house. Um, and I just wanted to know the answers to those. And, and one day somebody told me that that was, that was science. And I think that, uh, that a lot of kids have that same level of curiosity in elementary school. And then a lot of students start to lose that and drift away from science in, oh, maybe middle school, maybe high school. They, start, they, they don't really see the relevance of it to their, to their lives. And that's, that's the attitude that we, we need to change. We need to impress on students that science and math, engineering, these, these really are relevant to you. They're relevant to your future, and they're they're really important. So I think that the message um, to uh, is it Morgan? Yes. yes. Um, the message to Morgan um, is that you're at exactly the right age to really start uh, diving in to math and to science to explore the um, the different subjects. Um, you know, you're you're not going to know which one you like best until you've had a sampling of um, of a variety of them. So learning some biology, uh, learning some physical sciences, learning some, um, some earth sciences, some space sciences, and particularly focusing on the math because the math really underlies um, all, of the, all of the sciences is really, really important. And I think that I, I touched on some of the reasons that it's important, but it's, it's uh, important for your future no matter what career you choose to go into. And then having said that, there are a lot of really, um, actually really cool careers in uh, the different areas of, of science and engineering. Great. OK, Denver, let's uh, keep it going over there. Uh, who's got the next question? Go ahead. Hi, my name is George, and I'm a senior. And my question is, uh, how did your training and education prepare you for your first trip to space? How did my education prepare me for my first trip into space? You know, it was absolutely critical, and it was critical for a lot of reasons, you know, all of the things that I learned in high school, I built on in college. That's the foundation that allowed me to, um, you know, to pass my classes in college um, and to learn the things that I needed to learn in order to be qualified to even apply for the, the astronaut program. And they particularly prepared me for all the things that I was going to be doing 
as an astronaut. You know, we use math every day in the space shuttle. Um, we use uh, a little bit of physics almost every day in the space shuttle. To understand the space shuttle systems, um, you know, I needed to have a little bit of background in engineering because we were looking at circuit diagrams of the different parts of the space shuttle. We needed to understand the hydraulic system of the space shuttle. And uh, I didn't have a great background in electrical circuits or in hydraulics, but I had the background from math and science that let me learn that very quickly. So I think one of the things that, um, that I learned uh, most effectively in middle school and in high school and in college was how to learn and how important it is to know how to learn and be able to apply that because, you know, as you go through life, it was true for me in the astronaut corps and it was true, it's been true since I've left the astronaut corps, you're learning every day. And so this is a skill that, that you, you need to build early because you're going to be using it for the rest of your life. Great. Okay. Uh, who's next? My name is Mia. I'm a senior here in, at DSST, and I was wondering, in terms of extracurricular activities, um, what kind of things did you do to get involved, like outside of school, in order to um, approach your goals? As an <laughs> Um, you know, it's interesting. I didn't really uh, look too much at extracurricular activities as a way to um, approach my goals of being an astronaut. I was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, and it turns out that they, um, they helped when I was an astronaut, but I didn't think of it at the time. I, I love sports. I was outside all the time, so I was always invo involved in, in uh, different sports outside. I played uh, competitive tennis when I, was, when I was growing up. I also played on the high school uh, basketball team and, and volleyball team, played on the uh, Stanford's tennis team when I was at Stanford. Um, and I did that just because I have a passion for sports. I like, um, I like being outside and I like being active. It turns out that one of the things that's very important when you're an astronaut is to have an understanding of how you fit in on a team and, and how to uh, play a role as part of a space shuttle or a space station crew. And that's something that, of course, you learn in sports every day. It's, uh, uh, if you're playing a particular position or you're running a particular play, you need to understand what your role in that is. If you're on a team, there's a captain of the team, um, and, and you have a, a relationship to that, to the captain of the team, and that's very, very important. And it turns out that it's one of the things that, that NASA actually looks for is an understanding of the importance of teamwork and the ability to fit in on a team. Great. Okay, we're going to take another question from the web, so it's a warning to the rest of you in Denver to sort of think about your questions, so we'll come back to you in just a second. Um, but this one, uh, I think, is one we probably already, uh, we all have, uh, which comes from Alice in Orono High School, Minnesota, who asks, what is the coolest thing that ever happened to you in zero gravity? <laughs> Ah, well, let's see. Um, there is a long list of very, very cool things that, uh, that happen in, in zero gravity. And I think the first, I have to say that um, weightlessness is something that I recommend to all of you. It, it, you know, it's just fun. There's no other word for it. I mean, you can do 37 somersaults in a row. Um, you know, you can lift something that's 5,000 pounds just in one hand. Um, and it turns out that, uh, that there were several very, very cool things that we did. Um, of course, when Mission Control wasn't watching, um, that we didn't admit to later, uh, some of which I won't, I won't go into. Okay. But one of, the, one of the really cool things that you can do is take a, take a, a juice drink. You know, so just like some, um, we, we take uh, dried um, uh, fruit juices up with us and then add water to them and in, kind of inject water. And one thing you can do is um, uh, squeeze the liquid out into the, out of the, um, out of the container and just into the air. And of course it floats, but not only does it float, it all kind of clumps together and forms a, uh, forms a sphere. This ball just floating right in the middle of the, of the cabin. And you can kind of push both sides of it and it'll oscillate um, and you can kind of push it around the room uh, towards your, your other, other crew members. And then one of the really cool things is you can actually take a straw and stick it into this ball of floating orange juice and then suck the whole thing out of the air. It's just, and it just disappears. It's very, very cool. But of course, we never did that because we're very professional. Right, absolutely. Um, in space. But you've heard. You've heard I've heard. That, yeah, I've heard, heard that happens, yes. right? 
Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, do you have another question there in Denver? Who's next? Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Sydney. Uh, I wanted to know, how have you seen technology change after you went to space? What do you think about the changes in the direction that those changes are going in? Um, was the, the question, how does the technology changed in the, the space program, the space shuttle, uh, or was it, okay, I just wanted to make sure that I, okay. Wait, go ahead, speak up a little bit. Uh, just in general, or, you know, NASA's technology or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the technology, of course, is changing uh, very, very rapidly. Um, however, uh, the technology that actually goes into a space shuttle or a space station doesn't change as quickly as you might think. And, and part of that is because, first of all, it takes a long time to design and build and test uh, something as complicated as a space shuttle. And then once it works, you know, you've, you've taken years to build this thing and, and test it, and you've tested every single piece of it um, so that you're sure that it works. Once you've got everything tested, uh, you really don't want to be replacing things because then you have to test all those replacements. So you don't, you don't uh, replace a system just because there's newer technology. So you might wait five years, uh, eight years, nine years until the technology's been proven, until the, the parts that, uh, that it would replace have sort of uh, uh, worn out and they're ready to be replaced, and then you insert the, the new technology. So there are, um, there are a lot of old pieces of technology still in the space shuttle and the space station, a lot of new, uh, new technologies. Where you see the, the new technologies more is in um, some of the uh, planetary missions and some of the astrophysics missions. So the launching of, the, of large telescopes. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is a good example of something that was built to take advantage of the ability to uh, replace technology. So its instruments have been replaced several times with next generation types of cameras and instruments that have allowed uh, the Hubble Space Telescope to be relevant um, for actually decades longer than people thought that it would, uh, just because now the instruments are new and they're, they're finding things that the instruments 15 years ago could not have found. The same is true of the uh, planetary missions to, to Mars and to other parts of the solar system. It's easier to inject new technology in, um, in, in those programs. So that tends to be where you see some of the, the new technology coming in. Great. Uh, who's next there in Denver? Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a senior here. Um, how did your education influence your decision to become an astronaut? Uh, say that one more time. That I missed one of the key word in there. Uh, how did your education influence your decision to become an astronaut? How did the, my education influence my decision to become an astronaut? Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, that the main way that it influenced my decision was that it, it, uh, it gave me confidence in myself. It gave me um, uh, a belief that I was learning enough things, that I was doing well enough, um, and that I was doing well enough compared to other people in the class that this was something that I could reasonably dream about as I went through college and, uh, uh, and, and graduate school. Uh, you know, so um, education, you know, the more you learn, the more confident you become. It's, you know, it's fun to learn things. Um, you know, it's, it's really empowering uh, to, to know something. And I think that that's, that's the thing that I got most out of my education was just this, uh, this confidence that there, was a lot, there were a lot of things in the world that I didn't know, um, which meant a lot of opportunity to learn. But there were also a lot of things that I had learned in middle school, in high school, and then, then on into college. And there were a lot of things that I didn't understand, but there were also a lot of things that I, that I did understand. And um, you know, for me, math and science were, were at, at the basis of that, because those courses, they build on each other so logically, um, and they're, they're so useful in a variety of different, um, different areas that I really felt like my knowledge was building um, from, from one year to the, to the next. Let me uh, ask another question we got through the website, guys, if you can hang on for just a second that follows on that. Uh, this one comes from Ash uh, in Arizona at Arizona Virtual Academy, who wants to know, uh, why do you think that so many kids worry about math and are scared of it? I like math and science, but none of my friends do. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of the reason is that um, 
for some reason in this country, it's gotten okay to say that, uh, that you don't like math and you're not good at math. So I hear it from adults all the time. Uh, you know, I hear adults say they can't balance their checkbook, uh, they were never good in math, they didn't like math, hope to never do math, and, you know, that's just not helpful. I mean, you know, adults don't go around saying, I can't read, I never like to read, I, you know, I don't read. And um, I think that, that culturally it's gotten okay to say that you don't like math. It's kind of become cool to say that you don't like math. And we need to, we need to counter that. We need to get back to an understanding of how, that, you know, that math these days is it's just as fundamental as, as reading is. It's a tool that you're going to be using all your lives. And today, uh, literate people need to be able to read, but they also need to be able to calculate. They need to be able to, to analyze. And so, um, you know, we really need to change the language and change the discussion around that. Uh, because, you know, what I've found with math is that uh, a lot of people, when they, you know, when they start learning math, they're already predisposed to be scared of it because of what they've heard. They've heard that maybe it's hard, they've heard people don't like it, they've heard their parents weren't good at it, whatever they've heard. And so they, they think that, well, maybe, um, you know, maybe this is going to be too hard for them, maybe they're not going to enjoy it. When it's just like everything, you have to put a little time into it. And once you start putting some time into it and you start understanding how to do these problems, then it can actually be quite a bit of, uh, you know, it can be a lot of fun to be able to tackle a problem and solve it and understand the process that you use to, to solve it. So I think that, uh, that a lot of it is, um, you know, just the attitude that we've managed to develop as a society over the last, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years that says, you know, it's, it's uh, math is hard and it's okay to not like math. Well, you know, math isn't any harder than a lot of other subjects. And like a lot of other subjects, you have to put a little time in to learn it. But once you do, it's really rewarding. Great. OK, Denver, uh, we have two people left. Is that right? Great. OK, so let's get through those. OK, so I'm Flora, and I'm also a senior here. And my question is kind of based off on Ash. Um, did you ever think of giving up your dream because of other people saying they didn't like this or that? Like, did you influenced by what other people said to give up? Could you repeat that one more time, maybe a little louder? OK, so um, did you ever think of giving up on your dream of the people around you and going to you or things like that? Uh, like, um, you know, I, I, did, um, I did think about giving up on my dreams. I think, you know, everybody um, goes through periods where they sort of question themselves. They start to lose, maybe lose a little self-esteem, lose a little self-confidence. I did when I was, um, you know, in uh, ninth grade, 10th grade. I was lucky because I had, um, you know, my parents were very supportive and very encouraging, but maybe even more important, I had a couple of teachers who spent some time with me to help me build my, um, my confidence in myself, rebuild my, my self-confidence. And, and that was really important because, you know, it's just, it's just really natural to, um, you know, have a down day or a down week or, you know, a, a bad, uh, um, you know, just a bad semester. Um, and you need to be able to get over that and, and realize that, you know, tomorrow's a new day and you need to dig, dig back in. Uh, so I did have those, those periods, um, you, know, where I, you know, where I just wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do what I wanted to do. Um, but I had uh, support around me and uh, both supportive, you know, friends who, who helped me um, and, uh, you know, who I could do things with and talk to and also a, a couple of very, um, you know, very good teachers who spent some time with me. Great, okay. Um, how about let's take the last question from Denver. Okay, so hi, my name is Mesli and I'm a junior. So my question was, was there any part of your education which you think, or something that was missing in your education which might have helped you better where you are now? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll answer it maybe in a little bit different way. It turns out that there was a part of my education that was, um, that I didn't really plan, that, um, that you might think was almost a tangent um, to what I was studying that turned out to be really helpful. And it was while I was in college, um, you know, I, I got kind of tired of taking only math and science courses, because that's pretty much what I was taking. I was taking you know, a lot of math courses and a lot of different science courses. I was a phys uh, physics major in college, but I also took uh, chemistry and, and biology. 
And you know, just to uh, you know, kind of keep my sanity and have a little bit of a change, I started taking an English course here or there. And it turns out that I really liked it, and I ended up taking more and more English, English courses, so that um, you know, I was taking about an English course a quarter. And it turned out to be, um, much to my surprise, very, very helpful. And again, it was helpful because, um, because NASA, well, scientists and engineers in general need to be able to communicate. If you've discovered um, you know, some neat new effect in science, but you can't communicate to people what it is, it doesn't help you too much. So being able to communicate is, is really important in, in science and engineering. And you know, who knew? I sure didn't. I didn't know that when I was, uh, when I was studying uh, you know, math and, and science physics. Um, but it turns out that it's also really important um, to be an astronaut. So I, I talked a little bit about how important it is to be able to collaborate as part of a team. It's also really important to be able to communicate. So imagine yourself up in the space shuttle, and you really rely on mission control down on the ground, and you have to be able to communicate to them um, what your problems are, what your issues are. You need to be able to ask them relevant questions to understand what they're trying to tell you. So being able to communicate is critical in you know, pretty much everything you do. And I had uh, little or no appreciation for that when I, was, you know, when I was in school, but it turns out in hindsight that the English courses really helped me much more than I um, than I expected they would at the time. Great. Okay, so uh, we're going to give you the last question. I'm going to ask uh, another one from the web, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll pick on one of you. So uh, just think about your question, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to it. But right now, I've got a lightning round for you. A lightning a, a round. A lightning round, okay. so get ready. This one came in, and I, I, um, I hope it's not from a senior. I, I think it's probably a little bit closer to third or fourth grade, but it's probably a lot of questions folks have. So try to keep the answers fast. Do you think that going on fast rides at places like Disneyland are good practice for going into space? No, not the same thing at all. <laughs> how tall, space is much better. <laughs> how tall do you have to be to be an astronaut? I believe it's five feet tall. Five feet tall. Anything over five feet and anything less than six foot five. Is there a lot of garbage in space? Yes, there's a lot of garbage in space. Great. Uh, <laughs> would you want to live on the moon? Um, I'd rather live on Mars. Fair. Um, what animals have been into space? Oh, you name the animal, it's been into space. Horses have not been into space. Um, but any small animal that you never want to be associated with has probably been into space. <laughs> Is it good for pets to go into space? Um, I'm not sure it'd be good for pets to go into space. The animals that I've seen into space uh, didn't seem to enjoy weightlessness so much. <laughs> they didn't quite understand what was going on. And then the last question is near and dear to my heart. Can you get online when you are in space? You can now. You could not when I was in space, but you can now. That's cool. Okay, um, well, uh, Denver, let's go. See the last question here. Who's got it? Okay, well, I have a question again, Laura. Um, would you like to be our graduation speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, you know, I usually don't do graduation speeches, and the reason is there are a lot more of you out there than there are of me. So I'm afraid that if I accept one graduation speech, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so thank you for asking, though, and um, I'd be happy to put in a word for some of my astronaut friends. Um, and uh, let me actually also point out that uh, they've got graduation speeches on the mind because they um, were one of the finalists in the president's uh, uh, race to the top commencement challenge. You guys are really uh, shown out from all the other schools uh, uh, in the country uh, and, and got into the final round. So congratulations on that and thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks Dr. Wright for joining us here at the White House. Oh, thank you. Really I enjoyed it. Great. And Very hopefully good. we'll have you back sometime soon. Hope so too. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, of course, you can get this uh, video at whitehouse.gov if you have any uh, friends who are aspiring astronauts that might have missed it. Um, please share it around and uh, stay tuned for more. Have a nice day. Some background in science, math, and technology, and that's even basic living wage jobs. So it's important to everybody and it's really important to your, uh, to your future. And it's also important because uh, you're going to need to be science literate when you, um, 
you know, when you get out of, uh, out of high school, out of college, and start dealing with the world on a day-to-day -day basis because, you know, turn on the TV, um, log online, the issues that you see in the news have a lot of their basis in science and technology. And just to be able to understand those issues and Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the White House. Uh, we're here for a very special uh, live chat with Dr. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. A very exciting day uh, to have you here. So welcome to the White House. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, Dr. Ride's joining us today because the president actually just hosted an event here at the White House about the, his STEM initiative uh, and announced Change the Equation, a new organization. Um, and the other really exciting thing we have uh, are eight students uh, from the Denver School of Science and Technology. Um, when you, uh, you all graduate, um, but it's also critical to the competitiveness of the country. It's, it's vital to our economy that we have uh, a workforce that understands science, understands math, understands technology, and can put those skills to practice. And you might think that this is important just for the next generation of rocket scientists or uh, environmental engineers, but it's turn, it turns out that it's much more than that. It's really important for all of you uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that 80% of the jobs in the next uh, 10 years or so are going to require technology in Denver, Colorado, who are joining us. Why don't you guys say hi? <laughs> so we're going to take a few of their questions uh, here in just a second, but uh, Dr. Wright, if you could start us off by talking a little bit about the event that happened today and maybe try to relate it to why uh, it should matter for these eight uh, high schoolers who are joining us today. Sure. Um, Change the Equation is uh, the initiative that it was announced today, and it's an initiative put together by companies around the country, um, large companies and small companies, who really believe that science and math education are critical to their futures because they need to hire a skilled workforce and understand how they can affect you, um, how they can affect your lives, um, to be able to vote responsibly, uh, to be able to make intelligent decisions about yourself, your community, your family. You need to have some way to understand those issues. You need to have a little bit of background in science and math. And you're at the, the stage of your education where you're getting that background right now. And that background will prepare you for um, you know, your life after high school, but it'll also uh, give you a, a really good uh, insight into uh, all the opportunities that are out there for you when you do 